Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. And if you're just learning about this show now, please know it's on the air for you. And we do so by bringing on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain. Our goal for each show is to bring answers and options to making your lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And remember, if you can't listen to the show live, go to our website at answers.network and browse through a variety of heartfelt and enlightening topics. I am confident that there is something you will find that will bring, that will bring greater, jo greater joy to your life. Uh, I also have a favor to ask. Please forward at least one of our shows to your social media group and to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. This is just one powerful way that we can make a positive difference in the world together. Now, as a longtime entrepreneur, our topic today is a book I wish I'd had many years ago. It is also the title of our guest's new book, How to Grow Your Business Like a Weed, A Complete Strategy for Unstoppable Growth. Our guest, Stu Heineke, is also the author of How to Get a Meeting with Anyone and the follow-up illustrated guide, Get the Meeting, which features many of the unique contact marketing campaigns implemented by readers that were inspired by his first book. Now, Stu's books constantly show up in must read or my top 10 business lists on social media and have enjoyed glowing coverage in Forbes, Inc., Harvard Business Review, on CBS Radio, and in the marketing and sales press throughout the world. He has become a fixture on top business and sales podcast, and I'm personally grateful that we have him here on ours. Stu, welcome to Answers Network. Hey, Helen, thank you for having me on. You know, I listened to those, that introduction saying, God, who's coming on? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> like, I can't wait. Yeah, that's right. I can't wait to listen. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> so, well, Stu, before we dive into the book, um, you know, Share with us a little about yourself and what led you to focus on helping others build their businesses. Well, um, man, I, I have this crazy background. I'm, I'm, uh, I went to USC actually, so that's that's not so crazy. But I went to USC, studied marketing, but at the same time, I was also re I've always been really interested in cartooning, and so I became a cartoonist while I was in college um, and started getting stuff published and I joined the the, um, the cartoonist guild and learned from them that that um, readership surveys were showing that cartoons were almost always the best read and remembered parts of magazines and newspapers so I started I started mixing the two cartoons and, and marketing and um, and that led to all kinds of really crazy stuff I was I was mentored by some of the some of the best some of the cartoon like some of the best cartoonists in the world from Playboy and the New Yorker certainly my my heroes of cartooning and we we ended up forming an agency together and we we did all kinds of really wonderful stuff the thing is while I was starting that first agency business um I, I had come across this this circumstance where I I knew that I had an opportunity to reach out to the the big magazine publishers whom I wanted to create direct mail campaigns for with the cartoons with the personalized cartoons and um, and so I got some early um, some early successes with Rolling Stone and Bon Appetit and I thought okay great I got to reach out to the rest of the publishing industry which meant that I needed to reach about I don't know a two dozen people VPs of circulation at Time Inc and um, and kind of asked in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, et cetera. And, and so I put together this little campaign. I called it, a, I don't know what to call it. So I called it a contact campaign. And this little thing, it was, it's an eight by 10 print of a cartoon about each recipient with a letter saying, hey, this is a device I just used to beat the controls for Rolling Stone and Bon Appetit. And we should put these to the test for your titles. And that little campaign, it produced a 100% response rate, 100% meeting rate, 100%, they all became clients, so it was 100% conversion. And it all came from this campaign that I spent, I don't know, $100 on. <laughs> it was worth millions to me, but it just, wow. and that was my first introduction to contact marketing. And I wrote a book about that. I ended up writing a book, I should say, because I got really curious about, well, okay, I can, I can reach almost anyone with these cartoons, but what's everyone else doing? And I found that there is this whole shadow form of marketing called actually had no name. I called it contact marketing. Um, 
people are doing the most incredibly audacious, clever things to get meetings. And they've been doing it for really for centuries, actually, certainly for a long time. And, and so I wrote that first book, How to Get a Meeting with Anyone. And it changed, I just watching it change people's lives. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was changed people's lives all over the world. I mean, I've been hearing from people now for several years. It came out in 2016 for several years though, that my gosh, I read your book. I did, I tried some of the things I read and, and I started, I like, I made $300,000 right away. Man, we didn't charge enough for that book, but, um, but, but so that's been just a sort of mentoring or mentorship around the world. It seems to, to help mm -hmm. people improve their, their lives and, and, and create this sort of unfair advantage, this, this superpower to be able to get meetings with anyone. And so just concurrent to that, I, I ended up, you know, I, I we'll, we'll talk more about this, but I, I got really enthralled with weeds and, what weeds, we know what it means to grow like a weed, but what are they up to? How are they doing this? So that's sort of been, I don't know if that describes my career path or not, or even answers your question properly, but that's where I've been going. No, and I think that's great. And it, it certainly does answer it. In fact, and one of the thoughts that I had when you started talking about the, you know, using cartoons and things like that, and I was thinking, okay, so what cartoon would you pick for an international investigation company? You know, <laughs> you know. So, um, but one of the things when you mentioned about um, the follow-up book, you know, so, you know, when, when you did your first book and then you did a follow-up that was based on taking information that you were getting from the readers. So share with us kind of the wide range of entrepreneurs who actually paved the way for, um, you know, for this to happen. Well, I mean, um, well, I mean, so uh, if we're, we're so we're still talking about getting meetings and yes and yeah so um, um, I, you know, I guess the thing was after I came up with, came out with the book with the first book how to get a meeting with anyone um, I, as I said I was hearing from people all over the world and they wanted to share their their stories with me and and then a lot of other people said you know I read the book I loved it really enjoyed it but I wish I could have seen examples of the of the campaigns i only described them i didn't i didn't use uh, any photography or include any mm -hmm. in the first book so i thought you know i've got to come up with this next book which is which will be um uh, just sort of a, a set of case studies and um but also let's bring in more even more um uh, tactics for for getting meetings that's it's a blast to get meetings i gotta say it's you know when i send someone a cartoon that's my thing you know so um when i send someone a cartoon and if i uh, if I call ahead, perhaps if I'm reaching out to someone who's a CEO, I might reach out then to, to the CEO's executive assistant. You know, those people that everyone complains are our are, are gatekeepers and they keep us out. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think they're more like they're more like VPs of access. I mean, if you're talking to the executive the executive um, uh, assistant to a CEO, you're really talking to someone who's very, very sharp. They report to the CEO just like the C-suite does. You know, mm -hmm. they're 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 very very sharp people. So they're they're not just kicking people out; they're letting people in, and uh, but the right people in. And you have it's sort of like an audition to to get to. What are you doing? What are you saying? How are you reaching out to them? So doing something that causes them to just say, "Oh my God, who is this?" I love the way you think. This is incredible. Changes everything, and it becomes a superpower to to be able if you can connect with anyone. Wow, that that is the ticket to making everything happen in your in your life and in your career and in your business. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And what we've learned, I think, over the years is is that um, which with such great competition, you need to do something that makes you stand out. And so I love your concept of, you know, you're you're putting a cartoon out there, but at the same time, if I'm receiving that, I'm thinking. I got to talk to this guy. Yeah. I got to know more about yeah. the way he thinks. So anyway, I think it's a great way to go. Um, now, and, and now coming into your most recent book, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the weeds method. And I don't know that our listeners know that it's actually an acronym. Um, but because when I, when I introduced it, it's like, we're going to grow your business like a weed. Well, everybody knows what a weed grows like. Okay. It grows like crazy. It grows faster than everything else around it. Um, but share with what the listeners don't know that it's actually an acronym on scaling your business. 
Well, there there is an acronym. There is there is a, a Weeds model, um, and the acronym stands for Weed Inspired Enterprise Expansion and Domination Strategies. There are, are eight levels of strategy in that in that model. But actually, if we go even further out, we step further back. All of this really is is part of a, a body called Weed Strategy. And weed strategy uh, comes from, you know, I probably should tell you where it even, like, how did this ever even occur to me? Because Please it happened do. in LA, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty cool. But I was, I was driving down the Santa Monica freeway many years ago. And um, I think it like, you know, it was when traffic was moving really fast. I don't know if it still does, <laughs> actually. I've been- like, Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, six lanes of traffic going one way, six lanes coming the other way. And as I recall it, a 40 foot wide median, maybe I'm maybe I'm fudging that. It seemed like it was a pretty wide concrete median down the stri center strip. And it's all concrete. It's no place for a plant to take growth uh, or take root. And yet growing from a crack in the concrete in the, in the median, I saw this dandelion. And, you know, it's on the one hand, it's something we see so often. I mean, dandelions, they, they they conquer anything. They'll take advantage of any space and conquer it and make it work. So, um, and but on the other hand, you know, it's like, you wonder, well, how did it get there? Well, of course, we know exactly how it got there. We've seen dandelions do what they do our whole lives. But but I just, as I was whipping by, I'm saying, look at this little thing. I mean, it's, it looked happy. It looked those happy yellow flowers and those geodesic dome, you know, cool, uh, not cool, but just it depends where if you see them in your yard, not cool, but right. they're really kind of beautiful. Those, those domes of, of, um, of seeds that, that fly around and they probe every possible opportunity to take root. And, and I just, as I thought about it, as a, as I drove by, I thought, man, that's really impressive. It just, it landed there. It, it just said, okay, this is where I'm making my living. This is, I'm going to make a stand right here. I don't think it was thinking to itself, well, this really sucks. I saw myself as living at, at, at the beach. <laughs> you know? right. Like it wasn't, it wasn't upset. It wasn't held back by any emotions, stray emotions, I would say. It was just running its process. And and it was just really impressive. So as I as I went by, I just thought, you know, I hope I can live up to that example in my in my career and in my businesses because and I was just in my 20s then, but I hope I can live up to that. And then just it just started this long process of, well, what are, again, we know what it means to grow like a weed, but we, do we know what it, how, do we know how they do it? And, um, and why, for example, why wasn't, I don't know, you could pick any other kind of plant. Uh, let's say, an, I, I keep saying an apple tree, but let, why wasn't, why, were, why aren't apple trees growing from a crack in concrete, the concrete medians in the middle of freeway and the freeway or, or I don't know, um, petunias or something like that. And I'll tell you why, they don't have what it takes to be a weed. It's actually a special class of plant and they are incredibly impressive um, I don't know, just just guides for growth. They're they're incredible, and it turns out also. I, you know, I was wondering as I went by, I mean, what is it that makes that makes them so special? What what, what are they doing? And is there is there a unified model or theory that they're using that they're running that all of them use? And is, if there is, can we use it in our business? And the answer to both of those questions is yes, they do, and yes, we can. And I think there's some other things that I thought of when I thought of the concept of, of the weed. And, and that is, it's growing in whatever environment it's in. And it's not waiting till it happens to land on a particular farm where they're, um, you know, they're putting all of the right nutrients into the soil so that it'll grow just <laughs> perfectly and everything. And, and I think some of us find that we're waiting for the perfect situation or we're waiting. Well, it's not quite perfect yet. So I'll wait till I do this. And I think many of us do that in various aspects of our life. And the whole weed model is no, you don't wait. You go for it in the situation you're in and work hard to make that, that, uh, that particular situation work for you. And anyway, that was one of the things that I got from it by reading the book as well as, uh, listening to you speak on the subject. Yeah, you know, they, well, I think one of the things that really stands out is that weeds just deal with what is. That dandelion mm -hmm. that landed in the crack of the concrete, yeah. um, it just said, okay, here's here's where we are. And and it just ran its process and, and thrived. And that is what we need to do. And so it's interesting because I just mentioned that there's a model 
um, or a formula that, that all weeds use. And and so I, I should probably say, what, just tell you what it is, because sure, please do. So uh, um, they they leverage a fierce mindset and unfair advantages against collective scale, and they do it according to a process. Well, in their case, this process is millions of years old. It's well honed, but it's also a, a living process. It, it, it actually is there. That's how they evolve, actually, is that living process. But um, it's a living process that's there at to to solve issues, to to um, to I don't know, to to um, to meet challenges head on and just blast them apart. And then the, the really interesting thing is that the way that weeds are are just the way that they're made, they 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 actually have that process just programmed programmed into their DNA. So there's no training involved. They just do it. They all do it together, and and so that's that's their model. It's it's fierce mindset and unfair advantages leveraged against collective scale, and run against uh, run according to a process that's well honed but alive, living and and just always ready to to evolve and meet new challenges and. It's just programmed into their DNA so that you can kind of look at that and say, well, no wonder. I mean, like the, the weed mindset isn't, by the way, it's not this, hey, man, it's not like sitting around. Because okay. <laughs> I used to be, I, when I first, when the first, when the book first came out, the, the interviewers would ask, well, they didn't really know what to make of it. So they were saying, so, Stu, are we talking about this kind of weed? No, yeah. of course not. <laughs> But um, but there is a weed mindset, and you can see it. They don't have brains, so it must make no sense at first that that a, a plant could have a mindset. But you can see it in action. You just watch what they do, and if you mow them down, they 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 immediately go to work rebuilding. Um, if you try to control them, you'll find that well, you know, if you have a yard or a garden, you know that it's very very hard to hold them down or hold them back. Um, they they just they they've just got this relentless, um, aggressive and urgent and uh, even optimistic and, but but resilient mindset that causes them to constantly constantly push ahead and and make uh, make new well just make new gains gain new ground. So you know anyone who's way anyone who's saying ah, I'd love to start a business but this might might not be the right time. Um, I guess you got to ask yourself, well, when is the right? There is no perfect time. And we live in, 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 in constant disruption. And we've seen a lot of it recently, whether it's the pandemic or now the recession that isn't supposed to be, but it is. Um, but that's on the way. And, and we, we're, we're constantly going. I mean, recessions are like br the economy breathing in and out. They're always happening. So there is never a, f Let's, I would say that the perfect time is just do it now. Whatever, whatever is happening, just do it now and meet the challenges and do what weeds do. Deal with what is. I like that. And we have a listener question in bringing up the, the current pandemic situation. Uh, this listener writes, um, so many people have lost their, uh, their businesses over the last two and a half years because of the COVID shutdowns and the ongoing economic policies have put us in. Several of my friends with local businesses were put out of business and are struggling with the decision of whether it is worth it to, quote, start again. What is your advice about this? I think you actually just gave it, but uh, you can maybe go a little deeper. And this is from Tyler in California. Oh, good. Well, Tyler, thank you for for your question, and and I feel your pain. I, I get it, and and I've we've I think we if we're all in anybody who's been in business has felt this pain. Um, so, but having said that, you know, um, I'm going to say a couple things. One is, have you ever noticed how I, there are some people who thrive during these these um, these yeah. disruptions? I mean, and so we could say you could look at the example of let's say Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. or or Amazon, um, those two companies were just, and another one would be Peloton, those companies were in just the right place at the right time. Very, very lucky timing with the right product, right time. Uh, we all needed to get onto Zoom because we couldn't meet anymore. We couldn't even go to the office. Right. So Zoom mm -hmm. exploded. We couldn't, um, we didn't, well, let's say we could go to the store, but we didn't really want to go to the store. I don't, even, I don't know if malls were even open during that time. Let's right. hope they were, but... I mean, the fact that I didn't know that they were open means that probably, or indicates probably they were, they, those stores really suffered, at least at their physical yeah. locations, because we just didn't want, we were, we were shut in. But Amazon exploded because that's how you got stuff. 
And and so certainly we can see that that some of these some companies, some of the people that are, let's say the entrepreneurs behind these companies were in absolutely the perfect position or let's say perhaps lucky position so that we just we all had to had to use what um, what they what they what they were offering. But so I'm not I don't know that I'm really saying that you have to be lucky like that. Those were just lucky circumstances. But but if we look at, let's say, restaurants. And I don't know what kind of business I don't know what business Tyler was or is in or was in, but mm -hmm. but restaurants certainly is they're they're a great representation, if not the the yeah. actual industry that Tyler was in. But you could see that that some restaurants, um, well, they were they were just they weren't they weren't able they were they were caught flat footed and they weren't able to adapt at all. Right. Um, I but I would say that the restaurants that that had let's say email lists of all their customers. So that they had ready access, that they could communicate with them. They knew that. I mean, res restaurateurs knew that people were still going to eat. I mean, that doesn't happen. Right. That didn't slow down. People are still going to eat. And um, although they couldn't sit in a in a dining room, perhaps they. Well, I, I know I, I could see a lot of them pivoted to takeout, and exactly. that helped them. I don't know whether it caused them to thrive, but it helped them. And then there were others. So we're talking about pivoting now, and and. Um, and adapting or adaptability. And so there was one restaurant that I'd heard of, I can't remember the name of it, but they reasoned, well, look, we have a, uh, we have an email list of all the people that, that, um, that have been patronizing the restaurant. We know that they can't come in. We know that they were going to, they're still going to eat. And so um, instead of moving to takeout, they moved to um, selling, sorry, delivery. Well, it wasn't delivery. It was yeah. actually, um, I don't know, restaurant supply sort of stuff, but for homes. So it was, well, if you're going to be, if you're going to become your own restaurant, we're going to help you do it. And they, oh, they had see, a that's of, a, yeah, I didn't think of that one. That's a great point too. Isn't that cool? I mean, so you still, if you have, you have customer bases and, um, and you know that they're still, they still have a need. And so, mm -hmm. you, and that's what this is about. A lot of what it's about is meeting needs. And, um, uh, and, and so I, I guess if we if we're thinking about about what weeds teach us about going through these these uh, these disruptions, it's be it's one of them is to be uh, is to be quite adaptive, and and we can see that. Now, I mean, weeds aren't businesses, so they're not going to tell us, look, you need to go for you need to keep email addresses, and you, you know we have to we have to infer that. But but I think that you've just got to be you've got to take a nimble stance um, if you've ever studied martial arts you don't just stand there you are you're sort of gripping the floor yeah. it's, it's a different thing you're in balance all the time and it's sort of what we need to do as well I, and i hope that answered the question we could talk more about it but i hope that no, answered I, the question. Uh, uh, I i think it did um and and actually we're, we're going to take a break but i want everybody to um if you know somebody that has a uh you know a small business um you know this is a good time we're going to take a break but you know contact somebody and tell them hey you know, tell them how to, um, you know, how to listen to the show and they can come back because we're going to have a lot of other questions that go right into this area of how to grow your business like a weed. OK, so uh, we're talking with Stu Heineke. We're going to take a break. We'll we be back in about a minute and 15 seconds. So everybody stay with us. You're listening to Answers Network. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. West Shield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized school programs and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the field of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. Uh, with us is Stu Heineke, and we are talking about 
how to grow your business like a weed. And so, Stu, one of the things you talk about uh, in the book, you mentioned the importance of being in the right mindset. So what are the six mindsets that you believe are required for an entrepreneur or any sort of business leader to successfully scale their business? Well, I think, um, well, I, I identified six, uh, six of these in the book that, that make up the, the, the weed mindset. Um, and once again, if somebody's coming in late, it's no, we're not talking, <laughs> we're not talking about that. <laughs> so, but, um, so, well, well Stu, Stu, you know what I was going to say? You know what? If that got them to listen and you thought that was going to be it, that's fine. You can you can go do that afterwards, but you might learn a lot by staying with us. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. You might be saying, what what did I just tune into? But yeah. <laughs> I thought they were going to talk about something else. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I identified six uh, attributes that are that make up the, the, the weed mindset. So those are optimism got to come back to that one how can a weed be optimistic but anyway optimism and aggression and urgency and uh, adaptability and resilience and perseverance and so and you can see all weeds just if you don't if that doesn't make sense watch the weeds in your yard they do all of that really really well they'll show you the they'll show you this really really quickly um so i, I, I but what about optimism i mean how can that possibly be <laughs> right but here's the thing: when when we are optimistic, we're energized, and we 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 tackle. We just we attack the things that we need to get done, and and they get done fast, and we're, we're just incredibly productive. So, I, if we could talk to us, I think that the one thing that they might tell us is, um, you know, we don't have emotions, so they don't get in our way. But we certainly notice that you have emotions, and they get in your way all the time. So, mm -hmm. our advice perhaps would be to would be to let your actions lead your emotions rather than the other way around. I mean, so for example, I I'm imagining you worked out this morning. I worked out this morning mm -hmm. and, and you come out. I, I'm sorry. I didn't ask before we got up, but, but you seem like you're in great shape. I'm sure you work out. And, and so, you know, um, just doing that actually manufactures optimism. You come out of there going, wow. Okay. What's next? And, exactly. and, Right. I mean, it's, it's as opposed to when we're depressed, then then we everything shuts down that instead of attacking everything we need to do, we don't get anything done. And we think, oh, you know, I just don't feel up to it. And and you, you, we end up doing things that sort of close ourselves in. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling circular kind of uh, pro, not prophecy, but I don't know. It's, it's just a self-fulfilling yeah. thing. The, the more you don't feel like doing something and, and then don't do anything, the more you don't feel like doing anything at all. And, and it's self-fulfilling or self-reinforcing. And so, uh, so that just, just letting our actions lead our emotions, it seems to manufacture optimism. So, so there's that. Now there's one other part of the, of, the, so the, I got, I think the other parts make sense being persistent and, and aggressive yeah. and urgent and resilient and adaptive all, all, they're all traits that we have to have just to make it through life, really, but certainly as entrepreneurs. But well, there's one and, other one that oh, I, I just mentioned. No, no, no. Go, go ahead. Add that one. But then I want to come back to persistence. But, okay. Uh, so there's one other one that I, I just, I, you know, it's in another part of the book, but I, I'm, I'm realizing that that collaboration, they're natural collaborators. Mm -hmm. So that's also a, a, a key attribute to, um, to the weed mindset. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, so if there are people out there and they're listening and you're going, well, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, persistence, what is persistence? Just, you know, just working hard or making lots of phone calls or whatever. And, and I have a story that I've told before that is the reason that I'm in the, the, the business or businesses that I am. Um, and when, at 19 years old, I went into a gentleman's office and applied for a job and he's and, and I listened to him very intently and he three or four times mentioned persistence as being one of the key factors to be able to do this job and so he kept mentioning it and he kept mentioning it and I was listening and at the end of it he sent me away and said I need a 19 year old kid like I need another hole in my head um pretty bad way to be pushed out, you know, of, you know, I'm pretty much saying you're not getting the job. 
But because I listened, I went back to his office for about 10 days and I would be in his office before he got there talking to his secretary and he would look at her. He'd look at me. He'd look back at her and he'd shrug his shoulders like, I don't know why the hell this kid's here. I, didn't I get rid of him? But I was there. I was there. I was there. And after about 10 days, he comes out to the secretary and said, you know, okay, in regards to that case, you know, did you get a hold of this guy? He's not available. Did you get a hold of this guy? He's not available. Did you get a hold of her? She's not available. And he kind of looks over on the couch and is like, oh, he rolls his eyes and goes, okay, I'm going to give the kid a shot. Had I not been persistent, had I not been sitting on that couch, uh, you know, I'm now looking at 40 years later as an international detective and past president of the World Association of Detectives. I've traveled all over the world. I've been able to break up human trafficking rings and return parentally abducted children. I don't think any of that happens if I am not persistent and I'm not sitting on that couch when he needed something. Yeah, so, I, I, that's, anyway. a, that's an incredible story. So I just wanted to drive that point home. As you, as you mentioned, the importance of persistence, there's an example that is life-changing. Yeah. And, you know, so if you want to grow like a weed, if you want to grow your business like a weed, obviously persistence plays a, plays a, plays a big role in that because if you give up, you're your own worst enemy. <laughs> you know, like you're, you're guaranteeing you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. But if you don't give up, if you keep trying, you really are actually guaranteeing the opposite. You're guaranteeing that you will succeed. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, and so let's let's talk a little bit about adversity because I I loved in the book. You know your your approach is is that we're all going to have adversity. You know so so first thing is accept it. We're going to have it, and then going into how business owners can overcome adversity and the challenges in scaling a business and how you can grow through it or if you have to grow around it, which was your whole way of talking about what weeds do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that is, uh, that, that is what they do. Um, I, I mean, um, here's the thing. There are a couple of things that I, I've been saying a lot about weeds recently. So one of them is that weeds never do anything without an unfair advantage. And that's, a, of course, they deal with what is, I mentioned that earlier, but they never do anything without an unfair advantage and they never do anything alone. And, and then finally, they always focus on what makes them win. So we're really talking about using the WEEDS model, that the, the WEEDS model, remember the acronym and the eight levels of strategy, which is there to help us create unfair advantages um, for our businesses. And I would say that if, if, you know, if you have a business that has no unfair advantages, you really have no business being in business. You, you're not going to compete with anything. If you can. And, and, mm -hmm. and by the way, by unfair, what I mean is um, that your competitors will be complaining. Well, that's un that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, it is. And that's that's how you win with with uh, with creating these unfair advantages. And, um, you know, I maybe could I give a couple of maybe I, just maybe a couple of examples of my own, for example. Oh, please do. In fact, that's okay. actually one of my questions that I was going to get to. So you're you're ahead of me and I love it. Go for okay. it. Well, I, so there's a couple of them. One of them is um, I mentioned cartooning. I'm I eventually I became one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists. So I'm still one of one of their cartoonists. And when I call up someone, let's say I'm, I'm trying to reach just reach someone to go back to getting meetings, for example, if mm -hmm. uh, if I'm calling someone and I'm talking to their assistant and I'm saying, Hey, I'm, I'm sending a print of a cartoon, one of my cartoons. I'm actually, I'm one of the Wall Street Journal cartoonists and I'm sending a print of one of my cartoons and it's about your boss. That assistant is usually saying, wait, what, really? <laughs> Can you repeat that? <laughs> so um, so that's an unfair advantage. When, the, when my cartoons show up in the journal, they reach over 2 million readers. That's kind of hard to match. I mean, if that's a nice mm -hmm. thing, kind of hard to match. But I think so, one, of the, one of the advantages, one of the best unfair advantages I think that we could have is the ability to give, give or confer, create unfair advantages for our clients. Imagine that, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, if, and, and I knew from, from the very beginning when I was, when I first started creating the, those direct mail campaigns for, for magazine publishers with the personalized cartoons and they were, they were breaking all sorts of response records, you know, they, they'd kind of, they try to negotiate with me on price. And I'm saying, look, yeah, I'm, <laughs> 
Oh, because I might I might write even just a postcard of like a very brief mailing and 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 it's very cheap to produce like a double panel postcard instead of a you know a number 10 envelope with a letter and and all these other components and they would say well come on and I would charge a lot because I knew what I was I knew what the worth of what I was doing so mm -hmm. they'd say come on you you don't you shouldn't charge that much just to produce a a, a you know a, a, a postcard and I said look Let's let's understand what the what the the assignment is, what the challenge is, what what the mission is. You want me to create something that create that that generates more response for you at a greater, I mean, sorry, a greater response at a, at a lower cost than what you're spending per, per mailing now. I'm offering you that, and you're telling me <laughs> that I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I mean, like I'm offering to do that. What is that? Why, why is that worth less than? I, I don't understand. Where, where where's the? Where, what is your value? Um, I'm not proposition, but what's your equation of value here? Because I'm 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 going to give you a new unfair advantage. Do you want that or not? You know, I, I and I couldn't agree more. And I've you know over the years had to have similar conversations. But you know where you, know, you get somebody that you know that says, well, I can get somebody that you know that charges you know half of what you charge per hour. And I go, okay, yeah. I understand that, but. The contacts that I have in those countries means that I'll be able to do this in about one fourth of the amount of hours. So you tell me what is the more cost effective way to go? Yeah. What kind of a job? What, what kind of what kind of a job do you want done for you? Do exactly. you want it done well or because then you'll pay well? Um, yeah. So but but anyway, it's it's a, so you just dimension you just mentioned that you have contacts that allow you to do the same job that everyone else does in a quarter of the time that they do it. And so that's an unfair advantage. I mean, that's, that we need to cultivate these all over the place. And I, maybe I should tell you one other one. Um, so Please do. In, in, in the book, I mentioned um, that I was that I was starting a new award, the, Co the Total Weed Award. <laughs> and, and it's going to be, <laughs> it's, I'll, I'll tell you, Alan, if, I've been like calling, um, I don't know who's going to win the awards yet, but it's uh, it, calling them Total Weeds is going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, um, you, you you might have people like Snoop Dogg, you know, he might yeah. enter. <laughs> or, or 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 Jeff Bezos or or Elon Musk, they might they might so it's it's about recognizing particularly weed like growth and spread among entrepreneurs and startups and VCs uh and, and probably probably other probably more um, SMBs as well. I don't want to just stay in the in the startup space, but so so I mentioned this this uh, this this award that I'm going to start in the book. Of course, I need to follow through. If it's in the book, you got to do it. And um, so uh, so I reached out to this. This is the whole point of the the. This is where the unfair advantage comes in. I reached out to the uh, executive director of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Now, she happened to write the foreword to the book, to How to Grow Your Business Like a Weed. So it's like, I just had to call her or reach out. But I said, you know, um, I've, I've mentioned this award, the Total Weed Award. And, um, uh, and, and so what I'm wondering is, could we turn this into, I mean, like, could, could NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center be the home of this this award, right. right? And and we could sell sponsorship, um, and and I don't care. I, whatever we whatever we sell in sponsorship, let's say that all of it, hundred percent of it, goes to the center. So this becomes a, a fundraising um, event for the for the center. And she mm -hmm. said, "You would do that? Yeah, I would do that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Right. That's fantastic." And so, you know, one of the one of our first steps is to go secure um, a, a media partner for the for the awards. So. You know, we're, I don't know who it's going to be, CNBC or Forbes or someone like that. Um, NASDAQ itself already has partnerships with all of the, I mean, the thing is, I'm partnering with NASDAQ. That's, that's what's right. unfair. Um, I'm partnering with NASDAQ. We're going to have an, we're going to have an annual award called the Total Weed Award. You can't, you can't even participate in the Total Weed Award unless you know what, why, where did it come from? Like, oh, it came from this book. So. Yeah. So it's it's a weed strategy for the book as well, and a totally unfair advantage. I, you know, there are lots of authors out there, and we do all kinds of. You're an author as well. We do all, all kinds of things to help our our book grow, and I'm using weed strategy to help it grow, and so that that is a completely unfair advantage. How uh, there's no other growth book that can match that. There's no other business book that can match that. So 
I'm talking about creating these unfair advantages and you have to cultivate them constantly. Um, and if you don't have them, then you don't have a reason to exist. And I, I'm just going to finish with one quick thought here, if I, if yes, I may. Sir. Well, just that, that um, I live on an island, uh, on Whitby Island, in a little town called Langley. It's a beautiful little place. And, uh, and, and the, the central village of Langley is just, it's two blocks, First and Second Street. It's it's um it's just a it's a it's just a beautiful the the the, um, the storefronts on First Street are on stilts, going down a cl over a cliff uh, over the water. It's incredible. The pizzeria on First Street on that side of the street has the best view of any pizzeria I've ever seen. So um, uh, the the thing is that our town, that little town, is kind of a. I, it's, it's, a, it's a tourist place too, because people come in from, they, they take the ferry over and then and the first place they go is Langley. And and there are little shops on First and Second Street. And uh, and you, you can see that it's, there's little, it's like business in a microcosm it's because there are some shops that people have said, I've always, you can tell, I've always wanted to have a little shop and, um, and I'm going to sell incense and candles, let's say, something that nobody needs, you know? <laughs> Really, I mean, you got to buy. If you want to buy candles, you sure you need to buy them somewhere. And if you want to buy incense, sure you got to buy it somewhere. But to have a little storefront on on um, First or Second Street in a little tourist town that gets rather sleepy if it's not summer, and you're selling something that nobody really really needs, I mean, you'd be doing much. You'd probably be much better off if it was if it was just a toilet paper store, <laughs> you know, something sell something someone needs. Those are businesses that have no unfair advantages, and they they come and go. That's that's what happens. They keep you know they'll pop up and then then they give up after a while because they didn't bake in those unfair advantages. It's really important. Yeah, I agree. Um, so we've got. Uh, I'm looking. We've got about seven minutes left. And I've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, they're a little, little bit off topic, but I, you know, they've uh, our listeners have taken the time, so I'd love to ask and see what you can offer. This one reads: uh, Does your book have strategies that include dealing with interest rates on business loans, and even more complex topics such as supply chain issues? I had a, I had a thriving and growing online specialty food business three years ago, but now we're having problems getting basic supplies from bottles to labels uh, uh, in order to fulfill orders. Plus, the cost of our supplies have skyrocketed. Uh, I could really use some creative solutions and wondered if you have any advice or uh, and if your book could also be of help in my situation. This is from Haley in Utah. Haley, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm, I'm well, I was going to say I'm a little stumped and I'm not. It's just that there, these are things that are beyond your control. So um, um, the first thing I'm, 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 I'm reminded of is that weeds always, whatever is happening, weeds always deal with what is. So, um, but you know, you can't, you can't c control the, the supply chain. Obviously, if you can find other sources, and I guess by supply chain, I think you might mean that it's the long supply chain that re that reaches across the Pacific, perhaps. Right. Um, are there other sources here? Um, if the, by the way, if these are things that are needed, is that another opportunity for you? Because if you're, if, if, or for someone to, to produce these things domestically so that there aren't, to, to, to reach around the supply chain issues, I, I think you need to think like that. Um, because what you're saying is the way that we're set up now is not working. It's we're, we're run, and you also mentioned interest rates. Um, and I'm not sure how those are affecting you, but, but, those are another element that, you know, we're, we, we just have to, you have to deal with what is, we can't change it. So how do we deal with what is, you know, I, I, I'm kind of, Oh, you were going to ask something. Oh, no, I, I was yeah. just going to say to, to, to kind of drive home one of the points that you brought up that I think is, is very important is whatever, whatever it is that is slowing you down, it's probably slowing everybody else down in your position, which means if you can be the first one and you mentioned bottles or labels, and if you go, okay, I'm gonna start a label business because everybody else that's doing what I'm doing has the same problem getting them overseas or wherever they're getting them from. So maybe working backwards on the supply chain and taking over part of it, that's what I got from what you said. So I, I wanna yeah. share what my interpretation of it from what you said. Yeah, I, I think that, I, I just think that when, 
I don't know. We we have a recession coming or happening now, and I think I think you just described that it's already happening, and um, and and so it will be a time of great pain. But I think it's also a time of great opportunity. I think it's just that that I don't know. I don't want to mix metaphors, but one door opens and the other one, one another one closes, and. And so yeah. we we need to we need to really be on top of what what are the other what are the other doors that are opening while others are closing, um, mm -hmm. and I was going to say that you know I'm I'm writing a, 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 an um, an installment of of a new uh, um, newsletter on on um, on LinkedIn. I, I mean, it's brand new. I'm just starting it. It's the first installment, and I'm I'm writing about 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 recessions and and. You know, is there a way to thrive during recessions? And and if there is, is there a model? Well, there is a model, and we see what weeds do. Weeds thrive in in disrupted ground. That's that's how they how they operate. They are disruptors, but they also thrive in disrupted ground. They also have defenses against being disrupted themselves. And right. and so all of those things need to come into play. But certainly, what we know is we're going to have to operate differently, uh, and and fiercely during these times. But I think, I, you know, there are always people who, who thrive during recessions. And, and I want to be one of those people. <laughs> I don't want, I'm tired of you know, having, getting a haircut every time a recession comes through. You know, it's, yeah. um, I, that's who I want to be. So, so, and I, I'm thinking we all want to be that. And, and I think that requires the kind of thinking we just described. I don't think we went anywhere near far enough into it, but, um, but I, I certainly think that that you've got to watch for every opportunity to pivot so that you can answer what are what are new needs for and related to what you do but but new needs that your clients have or maybe your, maybe your, even your competitors have right and 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 I can just add for you know kind of to close the answer on regards to this is is that these are areas that are touched at in the book having somebody who is just recently read the book, um, you know, there's a lot of things that have touched on just like you're asking. Uh, and so we've got, we've only got about a minute. So I'm going to try to get this last one in. It says, um, you know, as a family of five um, who try to eat uh, a healthy diet, we've been struggling with the drastic increases of all food, especially in quotes as real food, uh, grass fed meats, organic fruits, vegetables, and oils. Uh, have you worked with any small ranch or farm businesses? If so, what can we do to get our government to stop subsidizing huge farms and conglomerates while ignoring the regenerative agriculture farmers and ranchers that focus on bringing healthy food to people while uh, regenerating, um, yeah, yeah, regenerating uh, the soil rather than destroying it? Hmm. Well, uh, first of all, I think it would be absolutely ironic to use weed strategy to help a farm operation grow. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would love the challenge, but look, yes. um, you know, yes, the, I mean, prices have gone through the, they're, they're going up. Um, again, we just, we just have to deal with it. And I think that, um, that the fact that you're growing healthy food is really exciting. And, and I know that there are, you've got to know, there are a lot of people out there who would be excited to know about what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe we should talk afterward because <laughs> I would yeah. I would love to find a way to use wheat strategy to grow your your um, your farm. <laughs> I think that'd yeah. be amazing. Um, well, and, and what what this one sounds like is is that um, that I don't think it's their farm. They're just saying that oh, they are yeah. a family of five that tries to eat healthy, and Got they it. feel that the farmers and 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 ranchers are not being subsidized properly, um, so that so that the the foods that they want is actually increasing in price more so than than even the regular stuff that everybody's getting, which is is through um, getting subsidized. So, you know, um, I will say, oh, do we have time? Yeah, just just we only got about like 30 seconds or so. On the island, we have all we have these local farmers and they do these these um, subscriptions. And mm -hmm. um, and so we get produce from them every week directly from the farm. Look around and see if you can find something like that. Maybe that'll help. Yeah. OK, yeah, that's a great idea. In fact, someone who I listen to, another podcaster, Dave Asprey, I believe he lives up, up on one of those islands as well. Or maybe he's up just a little further up on the Canada side. But um Anyway, um, Stu, thank you so much. I mean, this is great. Uh, I would love to talk to you more and, and even off the air. And it sounds like with some of the new things that you've got, uh, I'd love to have you back on as well so that we can kind of pick up where we left off. 
Maybe we should. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd love to join you again. Thank you so much for having me on. You're very welcome. All right. And for everybody out there, uh, next week, we're going to be joined by the former Miss Australia and author Tracy Seacombe. And she shares her new book, From People Pleaser to Soul Pleaser. And uh, this is a subject that um, uh, that I uh, I feel like I can relate to. And I think a lot of other people can as well. So um, do plan on joining us. And also visit our archives of past interviews at answers.network. And know that you can subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, through iHeartRadio, uh, YouTube, Spotify, and so many other platforms uh, to be able to listen to this show. We would love to have your comments. Uh, we want to do everything we can to bring you guests that can help make your life better. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on LA Talk Radio. 